Welcome, everybody, to the third episode of the Open Door Wrestling Podcast, your gateway podcast into the pro wrestling multiverse. The forbidden door is wide open in the world of professional wrestling, and we are going to traverse all gates. I'm DJM. I'm joined by my co-host and tag team partner in wrestling podcastery, the Subtle Doctor himself. What's going on, Subtle Doctor? Hello, DJM. Hello, wrestling fans and listeners. I hope everybody is faring as well as they can be this week. Uh, I hear a little creaking in the background. Do, do you hear that creaking? It's... It, oh, oh, that creaking. Look, cre- look I've been doing... Look, I, I, I've been looking into the DDP yoga, okay? I'm trying to get in better shape, all right? <laughs> no, no. It's not you, DJM. It's the hinges on the forbidden door are creaking. Because it's just been blown wide open over and over again. It is fantastic. Off the hinges, brother. Off the hinges. Well, fans. There's, there's so much interconnection in pro wrestling right now that we can talk about. And this is exactly what this podcast was made for. Just in the last couple of weeks since we did episode two, there's so much crossover in the world of professional wrestling across the independence and the mainstream in japan hell we finally got triple a involved actually for once that's awesome and and th- this is gonna make for a, a hell of a podcast and we're gonna talk about all of it later on but as we open up doc as we always do it's time to look into our stocks, Doc. Who's up, who's down, and who are we looking forward to investing in? Uh, for new listeners of the show, this is where we pick a stock in someone in the world of professional wrestling who we're seeing on the rise, someone who might be on the downturn, and what we also like to call the futures stock, where we look further ahead, maybe a couple of years down the line, to see who we might like to look forward to and we're gonna open this and doc i'm gonna let you go first who is your first stock up well very quickly before i get to stock up let me just say for the sake of posterity listen if you can subscribe if i let you ah there you go parentheses that in parentheses i let you all of you please subscribe (laughs) gotta gotta yeah gotta put gotta put over the catchphrase um So my first stock up this week is probably going to be, it's probably something you all could guess. It's probably something that uh, other folks uh, that have been watching the G1 are talking about. And just through a little tease, DJ, of my stock down, probably something people are not talking about. It might be a bit of a hot take. We'll see. Mm, But I like it. My stock up is... The Great O'Con. Hey, guess what, Subtle <laughs> Doctor? We just did an internet high five, and for the first time on this podcast, our stock up is the same. The Great O'Con. Fusion dance. Uh, yeah, Great O'Con. Stock rising for sure. I think... The potential that I and others have seen is being realized is maybe not quite right, but we we are seeing the groundwork laid for Great Ocon to be a true player in this promotion. Now, he had had a good G1 up to the point where we recorded last time. Now, I talked about the match with Zack Sabre Jr., which I thought was really quite good but since then he's had three main events uh with tomohiro ishii he's had a main event with kota ibushi with shingo takagi and he held his own right he he hung in he played his part he was fantastic in fact in the matches and i I thought that like when when I was watching him, DJM, I thought about uh, the popular uh, Minoru Suzuki, a man we'll talk about later, the popular interview segment that goes around every few months, right, where he talks about um, 
you know, uh, uh, young wrestlers and training them and says like, you know, what's really important is what they can't do. And why John Moxley is so great is because he can't do shit, basically. But but that's awesome. And it's kind of his way of talking about like uh, having wrestlers that uh, lean into what they can do well, very, very well, but aren't these sort of plain Jane all-rounders that are all the same. And uh, Okan is just such a, I think, shining example of this because he's not someone who's going to, I think at least in this incarnation, G- give us the four and a half, five star work rate on the Meltzer star scale, but he's got an aura and that aura did not diminish in the presence of Ibushi, uh, Takagi and Ishii. It just, it thrived. He thrived in that match and, and his work again, it's not going to blow people away that are like Dean Malenko fans. Right. Uh, but like, but there's something just uh, really cool about how unconventional it is. I I use the word delighted often when describing how I feel about when he does his wild man Mongolian chops and just yells to the heavens before he, the, the arms come down. Uh, it tickles me. And I mean, and, and he's got, you know, these uh, other martial arts backgrounds and he's got a very strong submission game that he brings to the table. And I thought his match with Ibushi in particular, that, that match really stands out to me. It, I'm going to mention Suzuki again, but did you see last year, uh, DJ, um, the Suzuki versus Ibushi match in the G1? Yes, I did. Okay, because I thought this reminded me of it in some, some instances. And I, I know that UWFI isn't something you necessarily love, but both of those matches really like had that flavor to them. They were very shoot fighty, and that kind of gets me going. <laughs> I really, really like that. So, I mean, I, and they the the company just has to be thrilled with his performance, honestly. And I, the future is so bright for this guy. I am inclined to agree. I was not as hot on the great Ocon as you were, but this G1 has really shown that he absolutely has a place as a heavyweight in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And you brought up the Mongolian chop. And the thing that I kept thinking about is who who does he... Who does Okan remind me of? Who does he remind me of? He reminds me of a heavyweight that isn't necessarily the most known for his grappling and his mat skills, but is just really, really tough and just really good at all of the pro wrestling presentation and and, and things. Just you see him and he looks like a badass pro wrestler. And the person that he reminded me of, ironically, since you mentioned the Mongolian chop, was Hiroshi Tenzon. And the the more that I've seen of him, it was like, there's some Hiroshi Tenzon. There's some Toji Makabe of just kind of a wild heel New Japan heavyweight that can really be a fresh element to the heavyweight scene and he's really showing that in the g1 i felt like he was a bit out of place in 2021 so far but the g1 has shown that he is finding his niche and it's working for him really really well and i think that there is a place where I can see the great Okan as never open weight champion yes. uh, or even IWGP United States champion. And I- I'm starting to come around on the great Okan. I-, I was thinking of Tenzon back in the day and, and it really clicked for me. So I- I'm, I'm seeing it with the great Okan now. It took me a while, but I'm starting to see it with him. So don't go back and watch the feud he had with Tenzon last year. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, well, I shouldn't say the wrestling's fine. The wrestling is what you'd expect, but they had uh, a like a feud over the Mongolian chop 
Yes, David. they did. Yes, they <laughs> okay, did. And like, <laughs> if it, just in case anyone in the audience doesn't know this, this is I was really high on this feud, you know, because Okan wins and he he gets the exclusive right to use the Mongolian chop, and then like. I don't know, two, three matches later, Tenzan just starts doing the Mongolian chop again and calling <laughs> right. it something else, right? And it's just like, he just won't give it up. And look, in a way, you can't blame him. I mean, he's been doing this for decades and that's just part of his bag of tricks. So he he's leans into it. it I fine, believe they were but. I believe they were called the Corican Clubs. <laughs> okay, right. It's just, so that was like, oh, what are we doing? But but no, I look. I love the comparison. Um, I I think he definitely has has that stuff, and uh, in addition to the grappling and the, the like martial arts strike game, and I mean, just my favorite thing about him again is his his presence. Like I love, no matter who's in the ring, right? He always comes out for, or, or no matter who his opponent is in the ring, rather, uh, he always comes out first and kind of draws a line in the sand in the middle of the ring, stands there with his arms behind his back, saying, like, you have your area, do not come into my area, I'm not moving. And just the the look he gets, it's so great. It's so great. And and I think, you know, he is uh, getting over in Japan uh, for, hopefully he's getting over for these these matches, because he's, I think the the costume and stuff has, has been over already. Like, you always see at least a person dressed up in full Ocon regalia at these shows in the crowd. So very exciting times. I, I I'm glad to have seen the light on the great Ocon. Yes. Uh, but it seems like we get to stock down where the lights may be t- getting turned off doc. No, oh, no. So tell me who your stock down would be. Okay, okay. Well, this is not... I, well, so I teased this earlier. Hot take. I think it is. But I want to a preface by saying this is not... Um, this is not your Hiroki Goto stock down. This is not a sell, 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 dump all your stock, this guy's done kind of thing. This is like... The fastball is going from 100 to 95, 93... And just be aware that the peak could be and probably is over. My stock down is one of my faves, one of the best, I think, to to ever do it. Tomohiro Ishii. Really? Yeah, it is. I, I think, you know, I was watching old G1 stuff from three, four years ago. And... Ishii's still great, David, but he's not hes not vintage Ishii. He's not at the peak of his powers in 2021, and that's quite normal. You know, I think it's, it's fine, and I think, you know, people are, at the end of the year, going to talk about his match with Shingo here uh, in the G1, and, and it's going to make their list, uh, you know, some people's lists, like in the, in the middle or lower end, but... I think that that's the only match that people are going to be talking about uh, from the G1 anyway, and maybe even from Ishii's entire year. Although I quite liked his match with Moose in New Japan Strong. But like, usually you'd come away from a G1 in, in years past and think, boy, Ishii, he had like three, four absolute barn burners, like five stars, possibly match of the year contenders. At least that's how I felt about him. And, uh, you know, part of it's probably down to the quality of opponent in his block. You know, he he can't have those kind of matches with your Ujiros and what have you. But, you know, he also has quite a few uh, just excellent, excellent wrestlers in his block. And, and I think the floor is still high, but the ceiling just isn't as high. So this is not going to be this. The stock is not going to be uh, to the moon. You know, it's it's not going to leave Earth orbit, but it should it should still give you good returns. Look for those four and a quarters to happen still on a regular basis, because the man understands his role as an underdog is tough as hell, loves to fight, 
I'm going to give you the fighting spirit stuff, but I, I think, yeah, I, I think that I'd love to be proven wrong, DJM, but I, it could be the case that in 2022, I mean, it looks kind of the same, even when the, you know, the country hopefully fingers crossed opens back up. So I just think the ceiling is, is, is lowering for big Tom. And, you know, it is what it is. What do you think? I'm going to mention the name of a wrestler who is just about one year younger than Ishii, but is a guy that I've said the same things about recently, where the floor is definitely still high and your returns will still be good. But you feel like whether it's father time or whether it's just booking or whatever, you're starting to see that they may not be quite what they were at their peak. And you still love them and you still expect to get a good show from them the way you're describing Ishii. And for me, that's Hiroshi Tanahashi. And Tanahashi is just about a year younger than Ishii, but it feels like their career is kind of in the same place. So I definitely get where you're coming from with Ishii. The matches are still good in Tanahashi's case and could he challenge for a world title? Yes. Could Ishii challenge for a world title? Yes. But do you see either of them right now in 2021 or 2022 going on a long run as world champion or maybe in Ishii's case as never open weight champion? Uh, probably not. Probably not. But that's okay. Yeah, It's not the end of the world. I've gotten so much entertainment value from Ishii and Tanahashi for years and years and years that at this point, I would be surprised if a decline didn't start from them. The <laughs> same way I feel about Yuji Nagata, who is in his 50s, but still manages to deliver a banger match every now and then even though he doesn't really have to Hiroshi Tanahashi doesn't have to go as hard as he does but he still does Tomohiro Ishii doesn't have to go as hard as he does now but he still does and it's still pretty damn good yes but both of them are in their mid 40s so you kind of have to acknowledge that it's not going to be forever. You don't think Hiroshi Tanahashi will be given an interview in a year or two before Japanese like parliament saying, I'm not here to talk about the past. <laughs> you, know? you don't think he'll, he'll buck the decline and continue to be great better than ever Ed, in his mid 40s. <laughs> I, I say it's very unlikely. There's only been two Japanese wrestlers that I know of that have managed to still be pretty good into their 40s and into their 50s. And that was Keiji Muto and Mitsuharu Misawa. Mm. And if there's anybody that could do it, it's probably Hiroshi Tanahashi. But I'm not going to put that on him. I think he's had an excellent year. and He has. He has. They've had to rely on him still, you know, due to, you know, factors, <laughs> situations that we all right. are aware of. But, yeah, I mean, it's I, – I, I wonder uh, – I, I wonder how he'll be used next year. I'm very I'm, – I'm looking forward to seeing – how Tanahashi fits into the landscape when they are fully loaded. Um, because, you know, even though the ability and the kind of uh, what he can put his body through is lessening, uh, I think he's it's definitely still got the connection with fans and fans still believe him and believe in his matches and, and love them. So if you can have someone like that, that's able to give you a four, four and a quarter star match down card, like, I mean, that's such a, you'll forgive the pun, an ace in the hole. It, it really is. And 
especially that he's the United States champion, that that has all kinds of crossover appeal because Hiroshi Tanahashi, that is a name that will be recognized. And Tomohiro Ishii's following in in America is huge. Uh, he grew this following because of the Western fan base. So I feel like for Ishii and Tanahashi, just to continue the parallel, I, I think that they're both far from done. Mm-hmm. Far from it. My stock down is a company, a wrestling company, that I feel like right now, in late 2020, really fell off a cliff. And that's Ring of Honor. They are my stock down. Oh, no. You remember the news that came out that said Ring of Honor would be suspending shows for the remainder of 2021, Doc? Oh, yeah. We we spoke about it in our first episode and how to how the company might continue to carve out a, a niche for themselves. Well, uh, I remember um, when GCW, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, had their weekend where people were just absolutely going crazy for their weekend of shows. And it reminded me that there are people out there who are, now are saying Game Changer Wrestling, GCW, might be the third biggest wrestling company in the U.S. right now. And number two, when the Tag Team Championship Challenge was answered, it was answered by the Briscoe Brothers. And let me tell you guys, the Briscoes never do indie shows. Ever. They did a one-off in in Shikara in like 2009 or 2010. I looked into it. It was a one-off. And they didn't do anything like that since they were still really, really young and kind of bouncing back and forth between ROH and CZW. The Briscoes never do indie shows. They are Ring of Honor till death. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the Briscoe show up at a GCW show, it made me realize, oh, Ring of Honor really is done to the point where they're letting guys take bookings. And wow, that that's really something. And 2022 will be Ring of Honor's 20th anniversary. And... They need to generate some buzz for it somehow. They just have to, or yeah, they're they're just in a lot of trouble. This is so sad, you know. I we both like a lot of their performers. It's just it's it's tough, man, uh, to for, for them to to stand out, you know, and. We, we talked about the women's division before and we talked about the pure division and we talked about the needing to uh, embrace that forbidden door opening and kind of bring the buzz in from without. But um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really heard, I haven't heard anyone talking about the anniversary show. And I mean, I'm certainly going to watch it and maybe it will be the case that like, well, it won't we will be until like March or something. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. I'm thinking, yeah. Okay. So maybe it will be the case that like uh final battle will be the buzz generating item, you know, that they'll, they'll have to uh, get, do it off the back of a, of a really great show. And so I have a similar point to the Briscoes doing something in GCW. Do you remember the new japan pro wrestling x ring of honor show in madison square garden a few years ago i do i do so one of the uh ring of honor matches on that show was um i believe it was uh, still a never i think it was a never open white title match but it was sort of held under the ring of honor banner it was uh will osprey versus jeff Cobb, and Will Ospreay has recently said that he's coming to MLW 
to do a run of matches in, uh, I think, December. Yes. You know, and he this is a guy who has worked final. But I think a couple years ago, he worked a final battle versus Jay Lethal. And he's not doing final battle this year. He's doing well. MLW. Of Honor's not, they're not having any shows. Not in front of fans, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think they're not doing shows at all. No, they're still doing TV. Okay. And okay. they're still promoting Final Battle as a thing, as far as I know. Um, I think they're still doing no fa- They're doing no fan shows unless I just have been... Uh, <laughs> unless Ring of Honor shutting up shop has <laughs> been the least buzzworthy big story of all time. Um, yeah, as... as... Yeah, I'm I'm looking it up right now. Uh, for this was from September 14th. Uh, Mike Johnson reporting that no more live events scheduled for the remainder of the year. This was in right. September. Yeah, yeah. That so that they are they're still. Uh, hmm. I guess they're just doing TV. They're they're doing these tapings in warehouses. So they're still like. They're, it looks they're like they're still TV. doing, yeah, they're taping but, TV. But you know, who's really talking about it? I know they're still going to do their big shows. Um, they're still doing Final Battle, but again, I just don't. It's not going to be in front of fans, and they're still going to. Ta- it looks like they're still going to tape it in Baltimore instead of, unless that's where their studio is. I'm ignorant of actually where they do their normal that, TV. That is tapings. that is where they it are. could be. That is okay, okay. Are. So they're uh, home base Baltimore, where they're just going to tape Final Battle from from there. So they're still going to do their big cards, but I mean, the it, it the the fact that like you have fans at Game Changer and All Elite, it just makes it hard. David, it makes it hard to tune into warehouse wrestling sometimes. And there are certain styles that uh, lend themselves to that. And there are certain styles that are hurt a, a lot more by that. Um, so we'll, we'll see where ring of honor lands on that. I hopefully independent, independent wrestling needs fan reaction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is just, isn't good for ROH at all. I really I'm so sad that. that I'm so sad that, uh, that they're your stock down, <laughs> but, but the Briscoes and, and Osprey sort of not, not doing, you know, like branching out, right. And doing other yeah. things that is telling. And who is coming into ROH right now? Exactly. Crickets. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, the, I All hope right. that when, you know, that we talked about this, I think, you know, two, two episodes ago that, you know, hopefully when, when they can get some of these guys like PCO and Roosh and others off the books uh, early next year, they'll be able to attract some, some fresh talent that'll get people talking and they can open that damn forbidden door, please. Or, or just, you know, have some decent television distribution or something. <laughs> but, okay. This is huge. I was going to save this point for, for our later when we talk about GCW, GCW is the number three wrestling promotion in America with no TV deal. Mm-hmm. Insanity. Total, like, flies in the face of all conventional wisdom. Bonkers. The, and it's word of mouth. It's, <laughs> it's, like, it's buzz. It's, it's extreme championship wrestling. Well, let's not say things we can't take back. DJ. Well, it's 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 spreading in that way. It's it's spreading the way ECW did. It's spreading the way Ring of Honor did. It's 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 spreading in that way. This is independent wrestling. This is this is GCW is the new super indie. For better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> for good or for ill. Yes. Uh but let's talk a little bit about our futures. Doc, who are we looking forward to seeing really rise up in the future and looking beyond? Um, letting you go first again. Who, who's your future stock? Well, I do not have a futures this week because I watched a lot of old people wrestle. <laughs> so, who, who? I think you have a, a selection. However, I do, I do, and. I think that this really won't be a surprise to anyone. 
I watched a lot of wrestling recently, too, like a lot of our listeners, like you, Doc. And my future stock is Top Flight, Darius and Dante Martin, Top Flight. Everyone knows that Darius Martin, the older brother of Top Flight, uh, went down with a knee injury uh, earlier this year and has been out for an extended period. And Dante Martin has been on a singles run in All Elite Wrestling, where he has really showcased some incredible athletic ability, uh, a a pretty good promo on Dynamite, uh, and that led into his match with Malachi Black. And in all of these matches, he has had strong showings, and every one of his opponents has given him a real strong sign of respect including Malachi Black, which really caught my eye when after their match where Malachi Black was victorious, after he was walking out of the ring, he gave Dante Martin a very subtle nod of respect on his way out of the ring. And that was huge because while Malachi Black won the match, it clearly noted that Black really felt like Dante Martin really brought him a really good fight and he appreciated Dante Martin bringing the fight that he did and it it was a little bit of that warrior code of honor thing that you used to see a lot in pro wrestling and I feel like when Darius is back top flight are going to jump into the tag division running because if you remember top flight in their earlier matches with the Young Bucks and Private Party and others, man, they were good. Man, they were good. And they're both still really young. Dante Martin just turned 20, and I believe Darius, the older brother, is only 22 or something. It really does feel like when you saw the Young Bucks when they were really, really young, or the Briscoes when they were really, really young, and you just know that as long as they play their cards right, the sky is the limit for Top Flight, Darius and Dante Martin. I'm really ready for Darius to come back and for Top Flight to just go off in the tag team division. Do you think that when Darius is back he and Dante will continue to embrace Bitcoin Barry, or do you think they'll kick him to the curb? (laughs) That's an interesting question. Uh, Leo rush. I think that, you know, I'm going to take a risk here. Sometimes with stocks, you have to, you have to gamble a little (laughs) bit, doc. You have to gamble a little bit. I'm going to say top flight keeps Leo rush. And they turn heel for a little bit. I like it. I like it. It's uh, they could even do some some trios matches. Oh, can you imagine something like Death Triangle, Pac and the Lucha Brothers versus Leo Rush and Top Flight? It'd be dope as hell. Ooh, man, that'd be dope as hell. That's Tony Khan. Bring the trios titles. <laughs> Get them. <laughs> Get them out there. Come on. Ooh, man. Top Flight and Leo Rush. That would be some high-flying athletic wrestling, man. I, I can't wait to see it. I, I, you know, certainly would be a fool not to be high on, on Dante. I mean, I think has, the, the kid has, like, the, like, best vertical <laughs> in wrestling the highest vertical uh it's been so long since i've seen darius i'm I'm like like starting to forget they were so good together like they both were just so athletic and so in tune with one another It, it really was like watching the young bucks in their early pwg days they were just so athletically gifted and so solid and so smooth like I uh, on our previous podcast, Grappalicious, I used to kind of bash Private Party a little bit. Um, <laughs> Top Flight was already miles ahead of Private Party. Like they're so good, 
And yeah. when Darius comes back, man, I I'm so in on top flight. I'm so in on them. I can't wait. It'll it'll be super fun. I mean, they have a very very strong tag team division and I think that's why their YouTube shows even uh will continue to be uh good and strong because y- you got, you know, your um uh acclaims and you got your varsity blondes and what have you that you don't feel like are ready for tag team gold but they need reps and they're also over so i think that division is pretty deep uh actually and you know some of the some of the initial teams in the promotion like best friends and scu you know are kind of either no more or sort of on hiatus due to injury and the the gap has been filled um, and specifically top flight. I mean, I, I am, I am also tremendously excited. I, I think this is like, they could use them on dynamite openers and even pay-per-view openers from now to the end of time. And it'll be fantastic. And I would watch and love everyone. I, I, I completely agree since day one, of all elite wrestling kind of like what adam page talked about which we'll get into later the young bucks talked about the importance of tag team wrestling and they have not disappointed and i feel like top flight will be in the center of it if we're talking about pillars of aew tag team wrestling i think top flight is going to be there i really do Okay, so let's let's run into our stories for today's episode, Subtle Doctor. Uh, we're talking about AEW, and first one here on the doc comes from you. Uh, quite simply, cowboy shit is back on the menu, everybody. <laughs> Hell yeah. As Adam Page, the hangman, made his return to All Elite Wrestling by winning the Casino Battle Royale as the Joker. He got the chip in the ladder match and has a world championship match against his former tag team partner, Kenny Omega, at full gear. Now, Doc, I think at this point, wrestling fans all over saw the promo that Adam Page gave on Saturday Night Dynamite on October 16th. And man, what a promo. I've watched this promo more times than I've <laughs> rewatched Minoru Suzuki and Brian Danielson. That's not a joke. This was a fantastic promo from Adam Page. And I never lost faith in Adam Page and AEW for a second. Not for a second. Uh... I never believed for a moment he would be lost in the shuffle, Subtle Doctor. And it reminds me of a recent interview that I saw Brian Danielson give where he talked about how AEW has already done a really good job of cultivating their own stars and young stars. He mentioned, oh, hey, AEW has Brian Danielson and CM Punk now. Those should be the guys that get these huge reactions, right? And then he said, Nope, the guy that got the biggest reaction was Hangman Adam Page. And yeah, Doc, honestly, I never doubted it for a second. Corn fed, Virginia bread, <laughs> cowboy shit. Um, man, I am I'm tremendously excited about this, DJM. I also was very puzzled at the, the kind of people say, oh no. Uh, CM Punk is here, and and American Dragon is here. Hangman Page is not here. What are we gonna do? Uh, he's he's losing momentum. You know, him not being on TV is is so bad. And um, I actually think and, and I felt like I was screaming at the internet. No, he's not. He's on paternity leave. His family just had a child. It's literally the same as John Moxley. Everybody just chill out. Just chill. I know. I know. And and I think certainly the having a kid thing is not a work. <laughs> but I actually think it worked out quite nicely uh, for for all involved, you know, because Punk and Danielson 
got to have their and, and Cole got to have their triumphant, you know, marches into the company. Fans got to just like love them and you know toss roses at them and have so much adulation and and Paige was not having to share the spotlight with them at that time when they were shining at their brightest. A few weeks go by and people are still popping big for those veteran guys. But it's they're used to them being on the show. And then Paige comes back and gets and gets his moment of, oh, he's here again. He's back. And his his triumphant return. And people still love him. I mean, I a, a thing that I was was worried about with him. Not not that I wasn't worried that they were going to change booking DJM, but I was worried if his pre-pandemic levels of being over would have diminished at all. And that, thankfully, not the case in any way. I mean, I think this is the best long-term story in wrestling, the Adam Page quest for the world title uh, and quest to not screw up <laughs> and quest to to beat his uh, one-time friend, now nemesis Kenny Omega. And the fans are, are bought in. Everyone is into it. And this promo that you spoke about was just incredible stuff. I think some people might think that it was a lot. Like, at the, the story has been moving at a very slow pace, and the promo might feel a little bit, f like, much in terms of the pace that heretofore has been. But I think it actually it makes so much sense. This feels like every every time Paige has been dodging a question, has been walking away from interviewers, like all the stuff that he got out on Saturday feels like everything he's been thinking about. And it feels like the reality of these past m few months has sunk in and everything that has happened has mattered and is motivating him and is pushing him toward the world title at full gear and it's just so cool that like in a company with CM Punk, Brian Danielson, Kenny Omega and everything like the the top baby faces is, is a homegrown star of theirs. Hangman Adam Page. It's fantastic to see. And the story of the storytelling with Adam Page, the thread goes so far back. Uh, it goes to so many things that Adam Page mentioned in that promo where he talked about how they left their homes in Ring of Honor and they left their homes in New Japan. And I said on Twitter that the thread with Adam Page versus Kenny Omega and its culmination, you can trace that thread all the way back to when Cody Rhodes asked to be released from WWE. And yeah. that thread goes all the way up to today. And that is some very inspired and serendipitous pro wrestling storytelling. Adam Page is the protagonist of All Elite Wrestling. This is his story. And since day one... It has been his story, and it's really impressive that it is looking like it's going to culminate, and Adam Page, as the world champion in 2022, I think is going to be phenomenal. It'll sort of be similar to when the Lucha Brothers beat the Young Bucks, in that you know that there is... A world of fresh matchups waiting for Hangman Adam Page. And I have no doubts that he will rise to the occasion. I have no doubts about it. Who will Andrade El Idolo disguise to face Hangman Adam Page in the future Ooh. for a title shot? <laughs> no. no, look, uh, in, all, in all seriousness, I mean, I, this is th this story I, I think that there are some issues with AEW of course that like people that are not into the company are people that are you know the raw raw WWE folks that want to see AEW not succeed there are issues with the company that 
they have an argument concerning that there there's like a, okay this is a fair thing to bring up or i see your point even though i disagree i i don't see that there are a lot of those kinds of people that really kind of don't like this story or say that it is bad no it's not that they don't like it it is that they say that it is bad and i cannot i cannot abide that viewpoint i think i mean this is what you this is what you want i mean this is just incredible long-term storytelling that uh, much of it has been planned, but some of it not. And they've, you know, that's part of wrestling is like when things happen, you know, making chicken salad out of it. Right. And, and the, the booking has been uh, amazing. And I think, I also think that he's going to win at full gear. What are the chances you think that he does not, do you think that they can kick the can down the road anymore without losing the faith of their supporters. No, it has to be now. It has to be at full gear. It has to be. I think that if they, I think if Hagman Adam Page loses at full gear, I think that it would be a little bit of a letdown. Uh, And that really shouldn't be the idea. I know there's this idea in pro wrestling that, the good guy, the baby face always has to chase and chase and chase and chase. But if all you're doing is chasing endlessly, what's the end goal here? And I, I just feel like if there's no end goal, then what's the point to the storytelling? I think it has to have... Hangman Adam Page winning the world title, and it has to have him being a fighting world champion going forward. I think that's what has to happen, and it has to be at full gear. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of people deflated. It's going to be a huge letdown. So you don't think this is a this is a Naito situation? You know, because there, there were a couple of times when those fans lost heart because Gato seemingly was just enjoying teasing them and never giving Naito his, his moment of totally you remem- going over. You remember Okada. that I'm a Hiroki Goto fan. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so I know heartbreak. Yes. I know heartbreak. And I, I don't believe Tony Khan is Gato. And I, I think that, so far, all AEW has done for the most part is reward people's faith. And yes. I think they're I think they're going to record. I think they're going to reward people's faith. I agree. And I, I think ultimately, by the way, the Naito fans were rewarded in January 2020 at one of the best pro wrestling moments I can remember in some time. But I think Adam Page will will be champion and i think those those fans will be rewarded and i'm really curious i mean not that the match needs any more spice or build but the next couple weeks you know he's gonna surely uh have some interactions with the dark order uh, and and the super elite and how are they going to continue to up the stakes you know, and make things more personal. I, can, I think it, it can only it can only be better. And the, the last thing I'll say about about Page, uh, unless you want to keep talking about different aspects of this, is I had forgotten how confident that he was on the microphone. Um, you know, I, I, in a company full of great talkers, Page is among them. He does not. Uh, he, he's not out of place there, and. You know, maybe I was just really bought into this uh, anxious character that does not want to talk. But when the when the hangman wants to talk, the boy can talk. I mean, and it was from the heart that promo. It felt so. It, it felt real. I mean, it felt really genuine. Like he was tapping into actual insecurities and failures. And I, I just was totally blown away. I mean, it was such a huge moment for him. It's it's why I have. It's why I never lost faith. It's why I never lost faith. And I think we've we've covered the cowboy shit pretty well, Doc. So I'm ready to move on. Let's do it. This ding dang match 
<laughs> on the AEW Rampage buy-in between the American Dragon Brian Danielson versus the King of Pancrase, the man with the worst personality in the world, Minoru Suzuki. AEW gave wrestling fans this contest on YouTube. Yes, everyone for free. And brother, was this a pro wrestling masterclass. Doc. I just kept saying it over and over again. Minoru Suzuki versus Brian Danielson. I, I had nothing else to say. The match speaks for itself. I was reveling in it. Would what, what would you think? <laughs> what would you think, DJM, if I told you that this match has been my favorite dragon match so far since he's returned? Would you think I was that- a crazy person? Not at all. Not at all. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. He made Minoru Suzuki look like an absolute killer. Minoru Suzuki gave Brian Danielson everything he had and more. Uh, Bryce Remsburg really (laughs) did his job, no matter what one dude might say. And it was... It was a pro wrestling masterclass. People are going to be replaying that one single elbow that Suzuki gave Danielson for years to come. It was just a masterwork. Also, big credit to Taz and Excalibur on commentary. Mm -hmm. They really did a great job of explaining the moves and the holds and the why of what was happening and the counter wrestling and all of that was just really well done. Everything about this was just chef's kiss pro wrestling. Just fantastic. And seeing the American Dragon at, at his in his element like this, it fills me with joy. Yeah. It, it, when it, and it was not just a sort of aura match that it could have been. Like, they they really worked their asses off. And it, it felt so hard-hitting. And it felt like an, a real Suzuki match. I mean, I have been, as you have been, a hugely into and a big proponent of, you know, Suzuki does America fall 2021. But like many of those matches just didn't feel like New Japan Minoru Suzuki matches. And, you know, he's man's getting older and he likes, you know, the easy paycheck sometimes. And who could blame him after a career like this at his age? But like this match felt like uh, it was taking place on the Cerulean Blue. And both guys were into it and both, you know, really gave their best. And it's one of the better like pre-show for free YouTube matches that I can remember maybe ever <laughs> like uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, I haven't rewatched it, but I'm, I'm itching to rewatch it after we're recording. As soon as we're done recording, rewatch it. You oh, won't man. be disappointed. And, and hangman Adam pages promo too. that promo too. What, where would you go? I don't often ask you this, but this is a match. I feel I can. Meltzer stars. How many you got for M drag versus Suzuki? I'm going to give it the five. Oh, damn. Oh, wow. Wow. That's and, huge. And, and the reason I'm giving it the five is because the crowd was so into it. And when you factor the fact that it was such a good wrestling match and the crowd was so hot for it, I really think that puts it over the top. I, I can't disagree with you. I can't. I have a half a star lower, but I mean, I, it was it's, it was a beautiful match. Go back and and really see how into it the crowd was. I shall do this. I shall do All this. Right. Okay. Are are we done gushing about AEW? I think so. I think we can All right. gush about a different company. I think we can. I think we can gush about a wrestling company that has been very near and dear to my heart almost as long as my love for the American Dragon. And that is Pro Wrestling Noah. Doc, I've talked many, many times that I am a Pro Wrestling Noah fan 
to the core. For many, many years, Noah was my favorite pro wrestling company. I saw them once they broke from all Japan. I saw them rise to selling 60,000 tickets in the Tokyo Dome. I, I went through them through the with the ups and downs. And now in 2021, I, I feel very confident that pro wrestling Noah is back on the upswing and I'm ready to get back onto the arc and I'm ready to see more action from the mostly green mat again. And my love <laughs> the, for pro wrestling Noah is, is starting to swell again. The mat outlined in green. Uh, do, so would you say this is your favorite promotion of all time? No, it's my favorite Japanese promotion. Okay. No question. As far as American promotions, um Chikara? Are you Chikara or gonna, ROH? It's going to be uh, Ring of Chikara. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um yeah, I had been off the arc, you know. And I think you had been briefly too just because it, the because <laughs> I love Noah so much, and I get really harsh on them when booking de de booking decisions go really bad. A and it it's because I love Noah so much, and I love so much of the talent they have there, and I have such an attachment to the brand that when they go off the rails, it just it really makes me frustrated. But... Katsuhiko Nakajima is GHC heavyweight champion. Yes. <laughs> great, great call. I, I think he's ready for it now. I think he's the guy right now. I, I feel like I have faith that they are taking a long-term view with Kaito Kiyomiya because he's still so young. He's only 25, Subtle Doctor. And I feel like they're taking the long road with him, not unlike with how Noah did with Go Shiozaki. I, I feel like we're going to be okay if you're a Kiyomiya fan. He had a GHC heavyweight championship run at 22. It was fine. It was good. Mm -hmm. But he's still so very young. I, I feel like he's going to be okay, Doc. How about you? I think so, too. I think he looks like more of a champ now than he did back then, you know, because he's older, more seasoned feels more confident in himself. The fans believe him more. I think his run without the title has helped him a lot in the eyes of the fans, you know, because he did some losing, but then he got those wins back. And, you know, except for, uh, you know, uh, no jobs, Keiji Mudo. Uh, he's, Patience. he's Patience. Got, listen, I listen. Okay. I hope so. Because, I don't know if the man has taken a singles pinfall since he's been in the company. I don't know if he's taken a pinfall. You know, they've, you know, you have your Sakurabas on uh, when he they do a tag team getting pinned. He lost. Well, to okay, okay. Oh, yes, yes, right. Lost to Marafuji. Um, he clearly respects Marafuji enough to allow him to be the transitional champion <laughs> to to put it on Nak. I don't think he wanted to lose to Nakajima, and I think that's. I know I, that probably sounds really harsh to you and, and hurtful because you love Marafuji. Um, I don't think Marafuji necessarily was in love with the idea of, of carrying the belt again. I think he, you know, he did it to, to get it onto Nakajima. Also, he didn't have to work the N1, which is, you know, good for him and the way his, uh, his body currently is. And uh, yeah, I I am annoyed at Mudo. I, I will say that like the way the way that his final draw ended with Kiyomiya, if you if you look at it like I mean if you look at it only on a piece of paper and you don't watch the match, you think, oh my god, <laughs> like here we go again, not losing to Kiyomiya. But the last moment in the match is Mudo thinking, I've got the kid now, I'm going to pin him, and Kaito kicking out, and Muda, Muto rather, uh, being kind of stunned by that a little bit, shocked by that. So I'm hopeful that the ne their next encounter will build from that moment, you know, that we are, that the, the phases of this booking have been, 
I, Muto, beat you like a drum, Kiyomiya. And now we're in this, I can't beat you. And eventually we get to the, Kiyomiya actually does beat Muto. I, I am, God, I'm so, I'm really, really praying that this happens. And uh, Doc? Doc? No, okay. Did I steer you wrong with Hangman Adam Page? You did not. I'm, I'm asking you one more time to take a leap of faith with me on the on the arc i'm asking you to take a leap of faith that it, it's gonna be a, a long-term view but i really believe in 2022 the money match is at the budokan kaito kiyomiya versus katsuhiko nakajima i i really feel that we're getting there it it's taking a while yes it's 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 a little slow the the winds are pushing the sails kind of slowly, yes. <laughs> but I truly believe we're gonna get there. I believe Muto knows the wrestling business. He understands where he's at in the wrestling business. He understands where Kaito Kiyomiya is in the wrestling business. And I truly believe that KG Muto will do the right thing when the time is right. It's interesting how, like both of these kind of story, or the Hangman story and the the Kiyomiya story, it's like so we both believe that they will be crowned, but the the only kind of questions being, will it be? Will they do it at the right time? Will the company strike when the iron is hot? And I guess that's the question: is like, has it been too long and labored? Like, will will the fans like care less, or have they already? Uh, reach the point where th they don't buy in as much to to that. I'm, I'm very, very curious to see how it'll play out. I, I haven't, like, I'm still in on this. I, I think I still have some faith that, like, okay, this has been a plan. Like I said, that there's been phases to this. Um, but aside from the the Kiyomiya stuff, the, the future ace of the promotion, um, the current heavyweight title scene, I think, is is just awesome <laughs> like i did did you watch uh did you get to watch the uh i, I know you saw uh, nakajima being crowned did you get to see the n1 semifinals and finals yes i did uh nakajima has been on an absolute fire run and yes noah's heavyweight division is really really exciting to watch right now uh, i i would name the seemingly ageless Takashi Sugiura. Yes. The also ageless Masato Tanaka. <laughs> and even some of their younger guys like Nakajima, who is perfect. Like he was in Noah as a teenager mm -hmm. and seeing him get from there to here. Just ah, love it. He's brilliant. It, he won rookie of the year in at like 18. So it's just seeing where he is now is just phenomenal. Don't Keno, forget about my man's Keno. <laughs> yes. I, I was going to say Keno, your guy, really good promo, really good promo, really charismatic, great ring gear. He, he's, he's dynamic. He's really dynamic. I, I've really grown to like his overall presentation and that, that's just for me, just the tip of the iceberg of what Noah's heavyweight division has to offer, Doc. Agree. Um, God, Keno looks so good in the red suit. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> I love that. But uh, did you, I, I don't know if you saw the, the Nakajima um, cage match uh, in which <laughs> Keno came out and totally dressed to the nines in a red, like three piece suit just to lock the cage. <laughs> It was awesome. No, no. Um, that but, that's that's he really does get presentation in pro wrestling, and that that's something that sometimes some of the Noah guys forget. But he really has the entire pro wrestler presentation down. He, in many ways, reminds me of Tetsuya Naito in just mm. how his overall presentation really works with his whole character. The man has never smiled once. I don't think P people compare his work to Shibata, and I'm not familiar enough with Shibata to to know. Mm. But 
Okay. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But whoever the comp is, I mean, he's this, he's my favorite guy in Noah. And his his rivalry with Nakajima, despite them for a year now or more being in the same faction, like they still just have these incredible matches. That in one final was blistering. They kicked the hell out of each other, man. And and these matches between them often end in knockout. And I mean, you can see why they just just absolutely destroy one another. And I think that match is emblematic of why I think DJM that Noah is, has the best house style for the pandemic in Japan. I think that when you have uh, no fans, but especially only clap crowns, like this style like works so well. I mean, and, and can transcend all that stuff. I mean, you don't really hear a lot about people complaining about the crowd in Noah. I think that's because they're really hard hitting, aggressive, you know, forward, forward, forward uh, style. It doesn't depend on the crowd the way that say New Japan does. Like to, to me, New Japan feels like they are call and response to the crowd and the, the match structures depend on crowd reactions in a way that they, it feels inevitable that they're hurt by the fact that the crowd can't make noise beyond clapping. And so they're slightly diminished in this, this era and, and Noah just doesn't have to, to deal with that. And they can, they can thrive now in, in this kind of uh, environment that we have with COVID-19 but pandemic or no, I mean, the matches are so good and I love their style and the, the whole tone of the promotion right now is can be summed up, I think, in two words that turn my knees to jelly and make me quiver and make my heart swoon, DJM. You want to know what those two words are? Hit me. Sports like presentation. Oh, 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 it's so good. It's just dudes that want their trophies they want their titles or they want to show the other guy i'm better than you and it fucking rules and that is what i love about the noah in ring style so much it just has a certain brutality to it where that is so genuine and it's just so very intense and raw and you feel as though these guys are giving every drop they've got for the GHC Heavyweight Championship or totally. the junior title or the tag team titles. And and I'm so happy that now, Noah, thank you, based Wrestle Universe, for having <laughs> yes. English commentary in pro yeah. wrestling, Noah. I'm so happy. I mean... I, I, it, Yes. <laughs> yes. I like, yes. Uh, yes. I, I can't uh, find good enough words to express my agreement with that sentiment. You know, Stuart Fulton and Mark Pickering do an incredible job. You know, they, they have done other uh, shoot fight MMA and wrestling promotion commentary. So they're really good at this. Um, and they, I think they strike a perfect, I was talking about like the tone of Noah, right? And, and I think they, they just totally fit in there. Um, everything is very serious, straightforward. You know, they know the names of the moves. They they treat it, I mean, it, it comes across like a football match, David. <laughs> like, it's so good. <laughs> like uh, the, the emotional tone of, of the promotion and the the aggression and everything is... Uh, is really underscored by these guys. I think that they're doing such a fantastic job. And, you know, I think that the fact that they're there and the fact that this promotion is on wrestle universe and you can watch it basically for free for the rest of the year. I mean, it's all like this, this springboard for Noah, like Noah can grow again. Like I thought that they were doing during the Go Shiozaki title reign. I mean, they were really getting some momentum over here and then, I think a lot of fans were turned off by... And then Muto happened. The, the, a lot of fans were turned off by the Muto thing. Um, but but I'm, I'm hopeful now that that there's, you know, again, this is an even greater springboard and they can, they can grow to even greater heights in, in the West now. 
Don't screw it up, Noah. Please. <laughs> um. Okay, so... Going back to GCW for a little bit, we talked about Game Changer Wrestling. They have a weekend of shows that got a whole lot of buzz, a whole lot of excitement, and they announced that in 2022, they will be making their debut at the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York City. Game Changer Wrestling is arguably the biggest independent promotion in America right now, and they are riding a wave. And holy crap, I'm actually going to get a popular independent wrestling company in Detroit again. They're coming to Detroit in November. I'm Whoa. so excited. Are you going to go? I'm going to try and go. I'm going to try and go, especially since my girl Chelsea Green's going to be there. I got to see my girl Chelsea. And this is really cool to see... GCW really picking up steam and the perception of them being a quote death match promotion they're really putting that aside they're succeeding where CZW could not and where IWA Mid-South could not in shaking that they're a death match company stigma and it's really working out for them and if you didn't buy stock in GCW, maybe now's the time you should. Okay, so I have questions. Because, well, all right, let me step back for a moment before I interrogate. And I'll say, <clears throat> pardon me, I will say, I respect and admire GCW greatly, but I do so from afar. I think... Something I've learned, you know, over the, the last you know year or so, and was underscored to me at the their shows last weekend. GCW is a really cool and amazing. Like it's a great story. GCW, I don't think is for me, DJM. Uh, but I I still, as I said, hold it in high esteem, and I think it's really cool actually that different kinds of wrestling companies can succeed in America that you don't need to be a sort of WWE with the serial numbers filed off to <laughs> have to, to, to be taken seriously um, and to, to make money and tour and do well and have, have stars. I think that that's really awesome. Um, so I'll say all that up front. Um, I think that I don't know. I mean, I understand the ECW comparisons, right? But I mean, ECW, ECW, I feel like had more, not only more variety, but was, was able to put on matches that were of a better quality in terms of uh, their kind of uh, work rate and the tightness of the product and everything. I mean, they had like, you know, your Eddie Guerrero's and Chris Jericho's and what have you walk through that company. Uh, I don't know that anyone like that is walking through the GCW door. And partly that's not their fault. That's sort of the state of wrestling right now and where people are. Uh, but I, I do, do you think that they, that they offer what ECW offered or is that just kind of a convenient comparison? I think it's the vibe. I think it's the vibe more than the wrestling product itself. Because the wrestling that ECW did is in many ways kind of outdated. And mm. I even think that the Ring of Honor style that I fell in love with has, <laughs> pun intended, you evolved. Don't say it. No! <laughs> no are you and and changed and i think that right now and in the last couple of years there was a shift away from that in independent wrestling yeah uh, i think that with companies like ring of honor and pro wrestling gorilla not having the same cachet as they used to and aew becoming what it is i think that 
independent wrestling has gone in a different direction. And I think GCW has captured that. They do the Joey Janela Spring Break. They do Josh Barnett Bloodsport. They do their mainline GCW shows. And they do Jersey Championship Wrestling. They they cover all of the bases. I love uh, their where, For the Culture shows, by the yeah, way. The highlight two, wrestlers for, of color. Those are great. Yes. Uh, and I think that what GCW under their entire umbrella is doing is they are covering all of the bases for wrestling fans that want something different on different shows. With AEW, you will get a smorgasbord of pro wrestling at every event. With GCW, you will get a card that is this, or you will get a card that is this, or you will get another card that is this. And I think that they do that in a really good, appealing way. And as long as they are able to appeal <clears throat> to different audiences and appeal to independent wrestling, I think they'll always, I think that they have room to grow. They are wrestling as rock concert i think like they are they're kind of they're like the limp biscuit of wrestling promotions i, I mean have you have you seen nick gage's entrance yes yes oh my god it's it's literally that it, i haven't seen anything like that since the sandman and and it's more extreme than that i, I and yeah i think the the it, it has its fans that love that thing. And to continue the music analogy, like I've never really been super into live music, <laughs> you know, like that's never been something that's really lit my fire. I'd always prefer to like just have my headphones on and kind of like listen and study the albums and, and that kind sure, of thing. Sure. But the experiential, like experiencing it live it, it, for music has not been my, my bag. And, I, I think that the fans that are like super duper in love with the company, I, I guess, and feel free to, you know, at open door rest pod on Twitter and tell me I'm wrong about this. But I feel like just being there live at these shows matters so much. And it, it kind of, it does seem like a, like a cool vibe. Like if you're there just having some beers and you weren't like, you know, give me four star matches, right. <laughs> um, that that will be, that'll be fun. But it's just, for me, not what I come to wrestling for. But again, I think the fact that it's growing so much and that it has the fan base that it does is so, like, cool. Um, I just, I would be Doc, sad that if wrestling was just you. this, you know what I mean? Let me throw something at you, Doc, and I want you to really think this over. Last year, you got to see New Japan Pro Wrestling live, right? Yeah, right before the pandemic. I did I saw right. New Japan and I saw AEW and New Japan both in 2019. Okay. So when you were at those shows, did the energy of being there live affect you differently than it would be just watching the wrestling on television or, or on a screen? Absolutely. There was an additive quality to it for sure. Yeah. And I do think that there is a place for that in pro wrestling and especially independent wrestling. And I hope that's something we never really lose because going to a wrestling company that you really love, it, it's to use your music analogy, it would be like going to see a band who you have four or five albums of and it's their first time coming <clears throat> to town in years and you absolutely love them and it's that experience that you are going to see this music act that you absolutely love surrounded by people who absolutely love this act just as much as you do and and it's one that experience of seeing it live and then sharing it with others that mm. I think that independent wrestling, I hope never ever loses. And I hope pro wrestling as a whole never loses. Mm. 
the, the the rough edges and the experiential. Yeah, I get that. And you don't really necessarily care if the lead singer doesn't maybe hit every note the way he does in the album. It's just like no. the being there, you know, and things like that. And uh, what did you what did you think of on that note? What what did you think of the 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 big headliner match from last Saturday? The Mox Gage. Oh, I was overjoyed to see <laughs> Matt Cardona get his internet title back from Effie. <laughs> <laughs> and the the run in from Chelsea Green, I absolutely love my mind because I don't know who I love more, Matt Cardona or Chelsea Green, but I absolutely love them both. And yeah, Mox and Gage was fine too. Okay, okay, so I feel the same way. I like the the kind of air and atmosphere of Mox Gage was cool, but I didn't think that match was was special at all, and. I mean, I, I think I don't want to s- say that Nick Gage is is due for a future stock down necessarily, because but but they they may need to start thinking about like who the who the next god of the shit quote unquote is is going to be. Um, uh, it's Matt Cardona of death Hello. matches. I mean, yeah, he he beat Nick Gage for the world title. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um that's that's true well uh, oh, but he, he will never I, be he'll never be embraced though by those fans on purpose like he's such a great heel like i love i GCW love that story universe yeah <laughs> i'm loving it so much i'm loving it yeah so i'm i'm very happy i'm really happy for gcw fans and like i said i'm 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 glad that a thousand flowers can bloom in the the field of pro wrestling Rising tide lifts all ships, including down in Mexico. And we're going to wrap this one up really quickly with something that got me excited. Uh, Cain Velasquez, the former UFC heavyweight champion of the world, for a brief period competed in Lucha Libre AAA. And to everyone's shock and awe, he didn't look terrible. And he wasn't just doing, like, fake MMA stuff in pro wrestling. He was in AAA doing Lucha spots. And it coined the term Lucha Kane. (laughs) And then WWE threw a ton of money at him to lose to Brock Lesnar. And we all moved on with our lives. Recently, it was announced that Cain Velasquez will be returning to Triple A, and the thought of seeing Cain Cain Velasquez doing Lucha Libre again is just the novelty of it. I find so damn amusing because so often you see combat fighters, mixed martial arts, and all of those other guys and girls they try and incorporate what they do in other venues into pro wrestling. And then my Enochiism PTSD (laughs) starts popping up and I'm like, Oh God, we're mixing MMA and pro wrestling and it's never good. Uh." But Cain Velasquez, who is Mexican American is doing Lucha Libre. He's doing trios tags in Mexico. And it was just the coolest thing ever. And I'm I'm excited to see it again, Doc. I really am. If only there was a convenient way to watch AAA in America. Um, I think they still stream on Twitch. I think they do. And okay, that's so they're, hard they're, for me to catch live, though. I'm very bad yeah, about that. It is. Like, I know their their big shows are Saturday nights. That that's the thing. Okay, and their English commentary exists. <laughs> <laughs> it it exists, and. Yeah, their their big shows are usually pretty enjoyable. AAA, uh, their regular programming is a little hard to keep up with because they don't always have English commentary. But yeah, AAA, their bigger shows are always fun, and Kane Velasquez is just another reason to tune in. I yeah, I'd like to I like to give it a look. Although perhaps for another show, we'll have to talk about why why I can't with the AAA actually <laughs> which I, is a her- heretical thing to say i'm, I'm not even mad because c- in many ways i get it i understand and it's nothing it's nothing to do with the booking either 
uh and it's and well, so, now you know, i don't understand yeah 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 <laughs> so we'll have to this is a big tease why why i can't with the triple a i'll have to i'll have to talk about that um okay. another time when you can have some runway to defend well we'll talk about that on a future episode of the Open Door Wrestling Podcast. Thank you all, everybody, for listening and tuning in uh, for our third episode. Uh, you can find the Open Door Wrestling Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher. Give us the five star. Doc works really hard on this podcast. He's a great guy. And, and lots of other things the Subtle Doctor has got going on. T tell everybody what you're up to, Doc. Well... If if you're interested in the the Doc multiverse, uh, I, you can hear my thoughts on anime at What Are We Desh Show. Uh, that podcast W A R U I D E S H O U. Uh, if you want to check out what I think about other kinds of media's movies, video games, and what have you, uh, the Media Missile Circus Pod is a thing. That is uh, coming out slowly, but still exists. So if you want to hear more of my voice talking about other things, you could check those two podcasts out. And you certainly can. And follow him on Twitter at The Subtle Doctor. I'm DJM. We are at Open Door Rest Pod. Send us an email at opendoorwrestlingpod at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts on the pro wrestling multiverse, everybody. Thank you for listening. Doc, do you have an ending catchphrase? Peace. Peace.